اب میں محترمہ فلیویا اگنی صاحبہ سے خواہش کرتی ہوں کہ وہ اپنا کی نوٹ ایڈریس پیش کریں السلام علیکم اینڈ ہیپی ویمنس ڈے ٹو آل آف اس ہیو گیدرڈ یور مین اینڈ ویمن ٹوگیدر وی ہیو کم ہیئر آن دس اوکیژن ٹو سیلیبریٹ ویمنس ڈے میں معافی مانگنا چاہتی ہوں میں نہ اردو میں بات کر سکتی نہ ہندی میں کیونکہ اگر ہندی میں بات کرے گی تو بھی آپ کو شاید سمجھے گا نہیں جو بمبئی یا ہندی ہے اس میں بہت پرابلمس ہے So uh, I will speak in uh, English, but maybe certain concepts I can say in a um, little bit of Hindi. Um, my um, Madam Naim ka bahut aabari hoon ki unho ne ek bada picture, global view aapke saamne rak diya, jis mein se mera kaam bahut aasan ho gaya. But before I start, I must thank Shahida for, for getting me here on this great occasion. And I feel extremely honored by the comments Madam Kishub made before and also for being the only non-Muslim speaker in this forum. And when we say a non-Muslim, most of the time we think Hindu. So to have non-Muslim but non-Hindu also. And in a way, um, strengthening the cultural fabric of our country where many different religions have flourished in the Indian soil, in the, in the South Asian uh, continent. And apart from Hindu, uh, which is mainstream, apart from Islam, there have been other local uh, religious beliefs. Uh, women have uh, come out in this and flourished and have tried to analyze the situation within our own context. And I feel extremely grateful that uh, Maulana Azad uh, University and Shahida in particular and others here have valued my work uh, that I do in Mumbai among women in general, among Muslim women in particular and the writings that I have written based on my own work theorizing the political events and the women's concerns of our times and not necessarily invoking great Western feminists like Simone de Beau or others but trying to theorize that what it is to be a woman, to be a minority woman, to be living through the difficult times of the nation state, of conflicts, of various situations, communal conflicts, caste conflicts, um, poverty conflicts that we are going through today, and what is it to be a woman in these context times. And I, I, I really appreciate that, and I'm very grateful to be here amongst you, celebrating uh, march it in this very meaningful way. Um, before I go on, let me just stop on the women's day itself and just bring before you certain glimpses of why women's day, what women's day. In fact, last year we celebrated the centenary of the women's day. It was 100 years since March 8 was declared as the women's day. So I want to go back and see what kind of struggles that women have waged to, to mark this day to say that there's some specific women's struggle. I think the first of them happened in New York uh, in, the la uh, in the century before last, somewhere in the 1880s, 1890s, when a large number of women were working in textiles, cotton textile industry. That was the same in India also when the textile industry started, when jute industry started, a lot of women who were traditionally doing weaving, coloring, all these crafts went into the industry. And at that time, the industry, there was no labor timing, there was no labor movement. And men and women both had to work for 14 hours a day. And at this point, it was the women who came out on the street and said, we cannot work for 14 hours because when you go back, we have to look after our children, we have to cook, we don't need, to ha we cannot even sleep for four hours a day. So we, you need to reduce the working hours for women in particular, but also for men from 14 hours to 12 hours. The demand at that time was to just to have a working hour, a day of 12 hours and not extend it to 14 or 16 hours. And that was one of the 
not just the struggle of women, but I think it is of the entire labor movement, where when women came out and asked for this demand. Later on, the labor movement strengthened working hours reduced from 14 to 12, 12 to 10, and 10 to 8 in the organized sector. But we also know a large number, like 94, 93% of our women are in the unorganized sector, where there are no regulations, no working hours, uh, regulation, or any other benefit. <coughs> but at least here, this was the first thing that the women as laborers have certain rights, along with male laborers, and we must struggle together against the capitalistic exploitation in the in emerging industrial framework. And that is how women came out to press this demand. Then there were many other issues, and particularly during the Russian Revolution, uh, prior to the Russian Revolution, uh, there was famine in Europe everywhere, and women came out asking for bread. And you know the famous uh, statement that the queen made, if you don't have bread, eat cake. This is the, that was the demand. That was a phrase that was made by the queen in response to the women's demand that we have to feed our families. There is no bread. People are starving. We we have to feed our families. So please make bread available to us. So that was another ba basic issue of food, accessibility of food, and the responsibility of the state to provide food for its citizens, for the women, for the families. And so women were not just asking about their personal rights, but they were all, always asking for something larger, for a societal need. So, um, in 1911, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and other socialist feminists said, but then uh, May 1st was already declared as a labor day. But then women said, we need a special day to uh, put our demands forward, and we need a women's day. So 19, uh, in 1911, it was declared as the International Women's Day. Then there were other struggles that happened uh, uh, much later. There are many, many other struggles which I want, do not want to go into it, including the right to work, into, including the right for abortion, uh, yeah, free and safe abortion. But also there was another major struggle uh, in Iran. After the Shah's regime toppled and Khomeini's uh, regime took over, and chadar became compulsory. Again, women went on the streets on March 8th, struggling against the compulsory enforcement of chadar upon them. And they said Iranian culture does not warrant this, does not permit this. And this is a new regime that has come um, um, bringing these impositions on us. So different kinds of women raise different demands. But I want to say how March 8th became an important moment for us in India. When did it happen and how did it happen? Because many times we think this celebration is more Western and has no Indian roots. But for me, March 8th, um, the celebration of March 8th or the public demonstration of March 8th, uh, in my mind, symbolizes the anti-rape law movement in India. March 8th, 1980 was celebrated as anti-rape law day. And I want to give you a little background. Many of you know this background. But for me, it is important to recollect this particular issue when we celebrate March 8th, because now we have forgotten. This was a case of a rape case that happened in Maharashtra. A 16-year-old girl, poor, orphan, tribal, illiterate, uneducated girl, who was working as a maid servant in somebody's house. And a young nephew of that madam eloped with this girl. Her brother had complained to the police station and she was brought to the police station. While she was being interrogated inside the police station, immediately after the interrogation, two policemen who were drunk on duty raped this girl. And, and she was just 16 year old. And there was outside her brother, the boyfriend, the madam in whose house she was working, they were all waiting and, they, and her name was Mathura. And they said, where is Mathura? Where is Mathura? So one policeman came out and said, Mathura has left. But Mathura had not left. She was still inside. Then later she came and she told them, I've been raped. For me, the important part of this entire case is that that small group of people who were waiting for her believed her. They did not say that woman is a bad character. She has got a boyfriend. She has eloped. 
and now she must be telling lies they believed her and they said register a case of rape immediately it, it was a small town and there were few shops there and it was time for the shops to close down so the shop people came and they said what is all this halagula about and when these people told them that the girl has been raped inside the police station they all joined together and they said call the inspector in charge now and register the complaint of rape against the policemen of the same police station now such a thing never happens didn't happen then doesn't happen today also we know all the time the rapes that happen inside police stations but because of this pressure when they said we will burn down the police station if the case is not recorded and with that pressure the case got recorded in in that particular small police station in a very small district uh, chandrapur district of maharashtra when the case came to the sessions court uh the policemen were acquitted why the policemen were acquitted was because there were no marks of injury on the girl and it was held that the girl did not struggle the fact that she did not struggle she must have consented and it was always also said this girl is not of good character she has eloped so she is not a virgin so she cannot be raped this was the sessions court judgment because of public pressure the case went on to the high court in the high court the the uh, it was reversed and policemen were convicted and the uh, nagpur bench bombay high court held that the uh, quiet acquiescence if a girl can't shout if she is under fear and she just lies there and doesn't struggle it does not mean she consented consent for rape has to be voluntary consent has to be free otherwise it would amount to rape policemen uh, uh, lost their jobs because they were convicted they went to supreme court and the supreme court body came in 1978 and what did the supreme court do supreme court reversed the high court judgment uphold the sessions court judgment and validated that mathura is a liar mathura has made up this whole story she had consented to sexual intercourse inside the police station with the policemen while she was being interrogated and to appear virtuous in front of the boyfriend she has made this story of rape and this is what the supreme court actually held this judgment came in 78 and actually this judgment would have just lied there but four legal scholars including upendra bakshi wrote an open letter to the chief justice and they said review this judgment because supreme court judgment is the law of the land this can be relied upon by the high court by the sessions court by the trial courts so please reverse this judgment review this judgment because if this judgment is allowed in the statute books the hopes of millions of mathuras in the country will be snuffed there will be no place for women to go to complain because this is what is taught about women this is what is being reinforced about women that women women of bad character can be raped uh, or are rather cannot be raped and they, women are willing to have sex with any man they come across and this is what the psych- supreme court is holding against a 16 year old poor tribal illiterate girl it is against this judgment when that open letter came out in the media that women women in political organizations women in various professions came together and we said they said march 8th we will uh, celebrate as anti rape law day we'll ask for a demand of the uh, change in rape laws and we want to change the structure we want to change the mindset of the judges of the police of the society in general about women about women's character women's conduct and that is why for us march 8 becomes very important because from that year 1980 regularly march 8 became celebrated as a day of protest a day, a day of struggling for our rights unfortunately in this whole capitalist uh, uh, era everything is commercialized march 8 cars are there march 8 uh, souvenirs are there everything becomes capitalized but for us in the movement it still becomes a day of struggle uh, uh, subsequently there were many other issues taken up but this is the basic um, formula which the indian women's movement has internalized and take it on a day to place our struggles before the state a day to place our struggles before the administration and also to come together as women to struggle and demand for our rights so it is uh, i do not see it as a 
commercial day of celebration and uh, having a party and having a dance and having something else that is being done today but a day where we we look back if today we are here if today women's education is a very important part of all universities women's libraries women's resource centers women's studies women's research has become very important in educational field in uh, social work field in every field according to me march 8 1980 gave birth to this whole realm of issues that must be uh, must must be come into the uh, mainstream me uh, medium and if today we are there uh, because many women struggled before us and today we have we take certain things for granted because other women asked for it and stake these claims which we cannot forget while we celebrating march 8 and that is very important and that must continue from there i want to just move on to what i do and what is the kind of work that we are involved in in uh, majlis in bombay firstly the name majlis doesn't raise eyebrows here in hyderabad it is taken for granted means this must be an association etc but in bombay in the south every time we are raised this question are you a muslim organization uh, moves on to are you a muslim a muslim fundamentalist organization and if you are not a muslim fundamentalist organization then by the name majlis then you change your name you be become something else you become um, si mukti si shakti if you are women's organization you can take another identity what that symbolizes this that for us now any progressive movement has to be sanskritized has to be hinduized and cannot have an identity apart from india means hindu or india india means sanskrit india means hindi and we took it this on in 1991 we been working from 1989 and we did not take on this name as a political issue we took it on because we wanted a multiculturalism of our country to come forward that women from every segment every sect can feel comfortable and hence we took on the name majlis and we also had the legal center called mashwara uh, so which made sense to a certain section of women we did not envisage that time that in 1992 babri masjid will be demolished we did not envisage at that time that there will be riots in mumbai a riots which were not there in 1947 partition time but this time there were riots bombay was uh, secular bombay was cosmopolitan in bombay labor movement most mo most important not a uh, uh, communal identity issues of labor issues of progress a very progressive a uh, place and this place got broken down on communal lines in 1992 and then the name majlis got even greater significance and became a political identity and at every stage according to me the most political activity that i have done is under great pressure we did not change our names we, we had problem for everything F registration fcra uh, grant seeking because post 92 bombay changed post 92 when you say shabana azmi you think shabana azmi is muslim you think nasiruddin shah which you never thought nasiruddin shah is an actor but suddenly you see he is a muslim actor so every time your muslimness your christianity your uh, minorityism became a political identity which could not be ignored into that how do you frame women so the biggest challenge for majlis has been to work with on women's issues but also realize that muslim women have different problems than hindu women christian women have different problems dalit women have different problems because in those days we used to have women's movement and hum sab ek hai that we are all women and we have similar kind of oppression and patriarchy operates on us in a similar way but the 92 93 riots told us that it is not the same when hindu women attack muslim women when upper caste women attack lower caste women and and you come with a caste or community strength of mainstream then the muslim woman over there has double or triple kind of oppression a one maybe she is muslim and may be oppressed by the community norms or family norms but she is also her son may be killed because the state uh, has unleashed its uh, wrath and a 17 year old son may be killed and tomorrow when a husband beats her up she cannot go to the same police station uh, because the same police have killed her son 
So where does she go? What is the area? What are the, what are the spaces open for her? All of us know Shabano happened. Shabani judgment in the Shabano uh, case, women's groups were one side, Muslim religious leaders were the other side, and there was a divide here. And all women activists, feminists, should be uh, anti-Islam, and Islam means fundamentalism. And when the riots happened, you had to enter a Muslim basti only through the communal community leaders, whom you had labeled earlier as fundamentalist. But if you are working on human rights, this would be the space in which to enter a Muslim ghetto. And at that time, we had made this film uh, on a Muslim uh, basti called Bhairam Pada, which had became uh, in the storm of controversy and allegations that bombs are being produced here, uh, all, all of that. And we had made a film, and maybe it, the film is still relevant. Uh, and then our whole perspective of personal loss whole per perspective for the demand for a uniform civil code changed. And I was one of the first who had the courage to openly say, if you want rights for Muslim women, you cannot have this demand of uniform civil code. You have to work within the Islamic framework. You have to work with men. You have to work with women. And then Madlis became far more politically significant for us. And in a way that um, Muslim men and women both began to accept Madlis as an organization who will stand by them in the times of riots, but he will also talk about meher and other rights, who will talk about how to intervene in community, in the Darul Qasas, but also intervene in the court. So doesn't look at Muslim women standing against Muslim community, but looks at Muslim women's rights, both inside the community and inside the civilian space. And very few organizations actually worked at that time. And I was labeled as dividing the uh, women's movement uh, or uh, appeasing the Muslim fundamentalists in, uh, in what they're saying, uh, denying Muslim women the right, though I was the only one who was taking Muslim women to the courts. Uh, and yet these kind of allegations came. Unfortunately, in 2002, Gujarat happened. And when Gujarat happened, when so many uh, Muslims were killed, what was important was the sexual violence unleashed upon Muslim women in Gujarat. We just celebrated 10 years of uh, Godra and post-Godra violence. And Madhis did a small research to bring the sexual violence of Muslim women into the, into the uh, commissions and uh, inquiry commission and before the court. And when you went there, what you realized is everybody would talk about some other woman who was raped. And that rape woman must essentially die. Because if the rape woman lives, it is difficult not only for the rapist, but also for the Muslim community. It is difficult for the family. What will you do with a girl who has been raped by a Hindu a mob during the riots? So every woman about whose rape we talked about was a dead woman. So I had it that, that rape talks to the de uh, lips of dead women. And there were many women who were brought in naked, who had uh, uh, wooden splinters into their vaginas, or sometimes iron rods. And the sexual mutilation of women was extreme. It was there in 1947 partition, but that time we did not have a constitution, life to right, life to liberty. Now you see a situation 60 years after the constitution, you're back into the same thing where the community violence actually unleashes upon women's bodies as a symbol of their own community. And most of these women were not women, they were girls. They were like between the age of 12 to 24. Most of the girls who were raped were violated. And most of the raped women were also burned to death. But what happened, I, I'm not bothered about the rape, I'm not uh, bothered about the murder. But what happened between rape and murder? There is no, there's no uh, name for that. Constitution doesn't have a name, IPC does not have a name. There's, you rape a woman, you burn her, but in between the mutilation of the body that takes place, I feel that is beyond all human, um, human values. That there is a woman's body in your hand. It's a young girl, 14-year-old, 16-year-old. And what you do to that body, according to me, shows extreme uh, deprivation of a human mind. That you can do this to a woman of other community makes you capable of doing this to your own community, women too. It is not very different. If you hate your women, there's dowry there, there's something else, then you can do the same thing to your women. So you cannot preach this kind of violence to be done to women of the other community without, without putting your own women at risk. 
but that was not understood. And if you see post Godra, post Gujarat, uh, the uh, violence against women and the brutality of violence against women, not Hindu, not Muslim, not this, not other, but generally it has increased to such a level. So how do we then bring Shabano case and the case of this particular Muslim woman who was pregnant and her stomach was slit and the fetus was taken out and burnt in public view and then the woman was burnt. How do you bring these two together? Because both are Muslim women. We cannot have one framework for Shabanu. We cannot have another framework for this other woman whose name was Kausar Banu. And how do you bring them together? While all this was happening again and again, we had the media representation was about the most extreme cases. There was a Guria's case. There was Imrana's case, the father-in-law um, ha had raped the daughter-in-law. And the most extreme inc instances were projected as the norm of the Islamic community and not necessarily uh, uh, the, that these are aberrations. These aberrations, father-in-law raping the daughter-in-law can happen in Hindu community. It is not the Islam who prescribes this. Yet the way it was projected that time, Arun Jatli was the law minister and he said all this happens because there's no uniform civil code. As if, if there is a uniform civil code, father-in-law will stop raping their daughters-in-law. So every instance could be put there as a political agenda of the right wing. Then where does women's groups position themselves? Where do we uh, have our uh, spaces to say, this is what we stand for? This is what, how do we have a nuanced women's, women's movement ideology? And for me, most important, last two, last two minutes I want to put this. Every time a woman goes to court to ask for maintenance, the court say, you have no rights post Shabano, which is not the case. There's a new act, Muslim Women's Act, which gives very clear rights. <coughs> now, more important, PWDBA, the Domestic Violence Act, has come. And when a Muslim woman goes to court, every time we, uh, there is argument that Muslim women cannot come under the PWDBA because Muslim women have no rights. And our struggle has been to put these laws, which laws of the land, which have been enacted by the community consensus like the Muslim Women's Act. How do we make it happen for Muslim women? What are the spaces we explore? How do we take this woman's right to simple maintenance or a settlement post-divorce as for the Islamic principles, but to be enforced in a court of law? And that's been a bigger struggle that at least the, as the name prescribes, if it is creating a space for Muslim women, both in the informal law and in the formal law, and making the judges understand, making case law happen, that standing beside this Muslim woman and to say that she is a citizen of the country, her rights cannot be violated, her community cannot be violated, her Islam cannot be violated, and her individual rights cannot be violated. That is a tall order and it's a very nuanced position that Madhis has consistently taken and each political situation had demanded a different political response. We are very small, we have a very small group of women lawyers who work for women's rights. But within that and writing about this experience is the only way we try to make an intervention. And I'm glad that kind of intervention ha is getting a sort of recognition today and many more people are coming to know about it. Thank you very much for giving me this. Speech.